But how do we guarantee you sure, sure. that they're going to I'm going to see some other people. There's a women's group there. Okay. Okay. I'll send all that I'll to you. That's the very best question because it was my first question. So I'm biased. Uh, and there's a couple of answers to that. What was the question? Uh, the question is that we feel like they don't follow the Constitution now. Why would they follow the Constitution if we write amendments to it? What's, gonna, what's the difference? And the answer is if you look at our history, which is, you know, Patrick Perry said in his famous Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech, this line is in there. He says, I have but one light by which my feet can be guided, and that's the light of history. Right? So we look at history, and when we pass amendments, the government follows those amendments for a long period of time. And it's not because there's magic pixie dust on amendments. It's because the single most muscular act of the body politic possible in the United States of America is the ratification of an amendment to the United okay, States. Okay, it looks like they're actually doing some more QA. Think about it, it takes two thirds of states to call a convention. Nothing else has a bar that high. And then it takes three quarters of states to ratify it. That means three quarters of the country said this is the way it's going to be. And if we look at the amendments to the United States Constitution, largely they're following. Right? And, and if you look at it really specifically, they're followed pretty strictly for about a hundred years. Ultimately, we drift because we're human beings. So what I would expect is uh, that the politicians and the courts will follow it, and if we have to do it again in 50 or 75 years, I'm, I'm down with that. That's okay. But that's our history. I mean, if you think uh, we still have the 18-year-old vote, we have women's right to vote, we still have the 13th, 14th Amendment still stands, 16th Amendment stands, 17th Amendment stands. We can go through all of them and virtually all of them, I say virtually because the 10th Amendment is a significant exception, but virtually all of them are still followed today for the most part. I think it's also important that we acknowledge that we live in a country under two different constitutions. And this is something that most people don't think about. This was Mike Ferris's answer to me when I asked the question. He answered the question, he said, what constitution are you referring to? which is a baffling question, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, are you referring to like the pocket constitution that you might carry around, the one in the National Archives, or are you referring to the one under which our country operates? And I said, I still don't know what you mean. And he said, well, the Supreme Court over the last, you know, since the beginning of the country, since ratification in 1789, has amended the constitution essentially or interpreted it, to use a more kind term, thousands of times in thousands of Supreme Court decisions, and that's the Constitution under which we live. If you want to see that Constitution, what that actually looks like, you can order it. I think they're out of it right now because they don't have the money to print the Constitution. <laughs> Seems ironic. Uh, but you can order the United States Constitution. It's about 130 bucks. It's over 3,000 pages. Uh, and that's every case ever issued by the United States Supreme Court to tell us what the Constitution means. You live under that one, and they follow that one for the most part. It's just there's a lot of stuff in there you and I and all of us don't really like. And the only way to fix that, there's actually two ways. One is you can get the Supreme Court to overturn decisions or lines of decisions, like we just saw in the Dobbs decision, hallelujah. But that would be 50 years, right? If we had, by the way, in 1973, there was an effort that was begun to overturn Roe versus Wade by calling a constitution of uh, our Convention of States to create a constitutional life amendment. 20 states ultimately passed that. It was defeated by the same people who oppose us today on the right, I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It was Eagle Forum, it was the John Birch Society working in concert with the AFL-CIO, and they defeated all that. In 1982, they defeated the idea of a balanced budget amendment. Now, in 1982, our national debt was $4 trillion at pittance. You know, almost, you know, just about, I don't know what that is, 12% of what our debt is today. And so, and I want, I'm going to jump from you to one more question that our camera guy in the back, he, you mentioned these groups that are opposed to us, and they're conservative groups, and I love them, and we're... we're Secure concert. Arkansas. What's that? Secure Arkansas. Secure, Secure Arkansas. So we're in concert with them on 98% of issues. Unfortunately, on this issue, Secure Arkansas stands with Planned Parenthood, Moraza, MoveOn.org, Plan uh, Hillary Clinton, Howard Dean, uh, Russ Feingold, the former communist senator from Wisconsin, Secure Arkansas stands with all those people. And so if, if you upload this and some of those people are watching or if you know those people, ask them what it's like to be on the same side as George Soros, Hillary Clinton, and Planned Parenthood. Because I have to say, I'm curious because I've never been on that side. Just saying. Okay, next. Hey, this is more of an observation. Yes, a question. Yes, 